Welcome back everyone. I'm Mike and this is my channel, Build It or Buy It, where I build things from scratch and then later determine whether or not it would have been better off for me to buy it versus building it. So the current build we're on is this trailer in the background and this is episode 11. So if you're interested in content like this, go back and check out the previous episodes. So when we finished off in episode 11, I had finished up the ramps and the tail light housings so i put together a quick punch list of the things remaining i talked about those but there's actually a few more items than i kind of recalled so um just got a list here of the punch list things to do we've got to do the fender mounts as i discussed um, i've got to attach the fender splash shields which are those pieces of sheet metal there that uh, bridge that gap between the fenders and it, keep it keeps it from splashing mud and water up on the deck. I've got the safety chains to attach. The, um, I got, for the most part, I've been fully welding things as I've built it, just so I don't forget to do it, but there's a few things that need uh, final welding. I have the ICC lights, which are the three lights that go in the middle of a trailer at the rear. Those are going to be recessed into this portion down here. So I've got to make the holes for that. The, uh, let's see, we've got the uh, license plate mount. I'm going to put that on the end of one of the ramps here. The, let's see, the fender steps. So in between, in the, in the space between the fender, right, um, right here, um, that's going to be a piece of diamond plate, which is over there. So in the front and back of each fender there's going to be a step um, I've got to do the double check I put that on the list just to make sure I don't forget because right now as I've been taking the tires and wheels off <coughs> excuse me I haven't been doing a final torque on the stud so that's on there just to make sure I do that before it gets used uh, the battery box I haven't decided whether I'm going to put the battery for the winch inside of the toolbox or not I probably won't um, I got to mount the toolbox and then the spare tire mount those are the items uh, left to accomplish. So we're gonna kick off episode 12 with working on those. Probably the first item that I'll do is the, the chain mounts to get those knocked out. As a, in the previous episode, I showed you the, the little weld-on clip there that, that came with the kit that I bought. And, the side effect of that is it, it's kind of a semi-permanent thing. So I ordered these here. They're a forged steel. They're meant specifically to weld on for safety chains. So they get welded on around the perimeter. Then that leaves you this clevis in that you can install the chain into. So you can, if you ever damage a chain, it can be replaced. So I think these are a much better way to go than those weld on um, little pieces that came in the kit. And surprisingly, these aren't bad. I think they're like... I think it was like seven, seven or eight bucks off Amazon. So, so we're going to get going on that. And then I will probably switch over and start working on the fender mounts. So I'll get you repositioned up at the front of the trailer. Um, actually, you've seen me weld things before, so I'll probably just pause it and get those welded on and then give you a quick look at that. And then we'll pick back up with the fenders. Okay, just finished up welding up the safety chain attachment. Clevises, for lack of a better term, so I'll pan you around so you can see those and see how they worked out. As I mentioned, that lets you replace the chain if you need to for whatever reason. Makes a little bit nicer install. Okay, so moving on to the fenders. These are stamped out in a big die, and so they're they're pretty close to the same, but there is some variation and some flex in them. So what I did, I'm using these, you can see here in the background, I'm using the uh, ramps as it makes a nice workbench. So I've clamped them down to where um, I laid out a, a line in this, in this axis here that's straight and then came off of it with two 90 degree lines. Um, so I can clamp the one edge down because you want this surface here to be uh, plumb, so it uh, bolts into the brackets easier. If it was an angle, um, 
it would be, then you'd have to try to tip the angle. So anyway, I want this surface here 90 degrees to the rest of the trailer. So I clamped it um, in that place and then on the other corner, same thing. I pulled it around and clamped it. And so that holds the fender basically in the same exact position and I, so I can duplicate it on the second fender. And then the filler, the splash material that they provide, it's oversized by quite a bit. So I just took some measurements to determine how far down this splash, splash shield needs to be, which is based, what determines that is the overall fender height. So I just transferred, I already knew my fender height, transferred that up from this line that I had created, measured this distance right here. That sets the height for that splash shield. And then I simply just marked a, used the fender as a, as a template and traced around that. So I'll cut that sheet uh, and I cut that sheet. There's two ways you could do it. Um, you could scribe that pattern or that splash shield to match the inside lip of the fender exactly. Um, and then that would create a butt weld, which is probably the ultimately the best way to go because then you don't have an overlapping joint. Um, if it was obviously a body panel on a car, that's the only way you can do it otherwise. So unless you lose a lot of Bondo to cover up the overlap joint. But in the case of the, that's a much more time consuming to, to cut that to exact and then to tack weld, tack weld, tack weld, tack weld, because it'll pull out of shape. And then to slowly start filling in all those spaces between the tack welds. Um, given it is a trailer, it's going to get banged up. There's going to be some rust on it at some point. I'm going to use a lap joint on that instead. So the overlap will be a half of an inch. So that original line that I scribed, um, there's another line that you can't see that's a half an inch taller than that. So I'll overlap, because there will be mud and water spraying around in here from the tires, I'll overlap it in a manner that the water and stuff won't want to go up on top of the lap joint and run down in it'll naturally want to come out. So it'll be in essence just the way it is now. Um, and I will I'll stitch weld that and then I'll use some seam sealer on the, probably just the outside and that way if water does get trapped in there, it'll have a way to get out. Eventually it'll probably lead to some rust, but again, that's going to be a lot of years down the road and it is, is a trailer that's to be used. So anyway, that's kind of my setup to determine how to cut or the material to cut out of the splash shield. So I'll get that done on both fenders. Um, that also now determines what my width is from mounting surface to mounting surface. So instead of trying to clamp the fender and hold it up in place now that I know this dimension, I can lay out the mounting brackets without even the fenders being in place, which will be easier because um, they won't be in the way. So I'm going to get finish getting this cut out. Um, I'll probably show you some of that with um, just a pair of electric, the, the shear attachment or a nibbler, not a nibbler, a shear attachment that goes on a drill. Um, because running it through the bandsaw would be really noisy. The plasma cutter would work, but it will, and it'll, it'll definitely warp it a little bit because of the heat. So the best way to do it is to do it cold so that I don't distort the metal. So I'll do that with the shears on both pieces. Um, for the mounting brackets and so I'll show you a little bit later when I get closer. I'm just going to use angle iron on the inside here. So it will be the angle iron, the fender, and then that aluminum diamond plate step, and it'll all be sandwiched with a bolt. So you won't, the aluminum step will actually hide the bolt head, the nut will be on the inside of the fender, so it'll be a nice clean install. You won't see any of the hardware. So I'll bring you back when I've got some of that stuff cut and ready to go, and, um, and then you'll kind of see how it, how it plays out. Welcome back everyone. So here's what I'm going to um, do regarding the fender mounts. I'm working on those uh, today or in this footage. So the brackets, I'll pan you over here. The brackets for the fenders are going to be just a piece of angle iron. It's an inch and a quarter by three sixteenths. Uh, and it'll stick out from the main frame and then the Fender will bolt to that so it will stick in this frame and basically this configuration The fender will come up here and bolt that way and then there'll be that diamond plate step that I said or I talked about earlier that will also be there and all three bolt get bolted to this um, I'm bolting them on versus welding them on because One it's not uncommon for a fender to get damaged secondly every once in a while They might be in the way of something plus it'll give you a little extra room. So 
I want to make them to where they um, are removable, which is a couple wrenches. So these mounts do get welded on. I have the holes pre-drilled, but it'll be 5 16 bolts. But right now I just drilled it with an eighth inch, eighth inch hole, as you can see. And the reason for that is if I drilled the final 5 16 holes, I could do enough measuring on the fenders to put the holes in the matching places, or I could even clamp the fenders up and use a transfer punch, but it's hard. The transfer punch in 3 16 is pretty hard. It's, they're almost not deep enough. So at any rate, I'll weld the brackets on, leave the eighth inch holes. Once I get the splash panels cut and attached, I'll just set the fenders back up here where they belong, and then I can take that same eighth inch drill, use these holes as a guide bushing and drill through the fender and then it'll be easy enough to enlarge these and the fenders to, um, to the 5 16 So what I've done here, you can see this bar. I just clamped a bar all the way across the trailer. That way it gives me a nice level surface for these to sit on. I could do it with, you know, hold, hold them up there and use the square and mess around, but trying to hold apart in two axes isn't the easiest thing. So this way I don't have to worry about the one axis all i have to worry about is is this way left and right and that's easy enough to just check with a square before i tack them down so that's kind of the lineup for how i'm going to do the mounts Okay, I got a quick side project. This is one of those grinders that I've had for enough years that with the, even though there's a strain relief, this works enough. The cable, that it, it breaks the wire inside of the insulation, so depending on the cord angle, you lose a connection. So this one's getting to where it kind of only works if you bend the cord one specific way. So I'm going to stop for a few minutes and fix that, and then I'll bring you back. Okay, that uh, grinder's all fixed up. I th thought I'd maybe share that with you because some of you may have experienced that before. If you've got a grinder, drill, it doesn't really matter. Anything that you've had for a lot of years and the cord goes through a lot of bend cycles. It, um, and then if you start having an intermittent uh, working problem, it's 99% of the time it's a spot in the wire that's from being bent enough times it breaks the conductor on the inside and that's indeed what it was on this grinder it was about three inches back so i'll show you it was on the on the neutral let wire so i just cleaned the um took a razor blade and cleaned the insulation back so you can probably there's a little bit of a dark spot in the insulation maybe uh and then all you got to do is bend it and i did not cut that wire that was just from working back and forth and the, and the black spots is from the arcing and so you know, when you get an open in the wire like that then you get the intermittent problem so it's just a matter of cutting the, the cable down by four or five inches and reattaching it to the switch and you're back in business so let's get back to trimming those pieces off So what I'm going to do here with this piece of cardboard is just make a make up a pattern or template that mimics what I'm wanting to do with the diamond plate. Um, so then that'll kind of then I can mock it up there and see if it's kind of the shape and the size I want. And if not, I'll change it versus cutting the aluminum out. If it's not what I like, then I wasted that piece of aluminum. Okay, so this is the shape um, we end up with that I'm anticipating. You can see that I already made a miscalculation against the point of making these. So I'll go ahead and fold this up and show you. I already know where I made my mistake, but I guess I could not show you this, but it shows that everybody does make mistakes. I forgot to take into account the thickness of the flange that I'm going to bend down. 
So that's the shape. These will get broke down, so you'll end up with a diamond place piece that looks like this that goes in here. And it'll slip behind this bracket. And right now, as you can see, the this sticks out right here. This should have come out to here. So would be fine if I was attaching to the rub rail here, but I'm not attaching to the rub rail. It's going to tuck in underneath the rub rail and go to the main frame. So, but this, any, at any rate, I guess it gives you an idea of what there will be there. Um, I just need to add two inches to the backside. So I'll redo that again. Yeah. All right, that looks a little bit better. I thought that other one looked a little small when I was halfway through making it. Okay. Well, that would clearly be not correct either. Apparently, I don't know how to measure that one sticking out. So, it's just a diagonal measurement that's off. And that's a really easy fix. Look in there just like that and give you a, a little step if you needed to have a step to get up on the deck. It's not that much lower than what the deck height is. It just makes it kind of more or less finishes it out, makes it look a little nicer, and then hides that, that uh, fender bracket. So anyway, that is the correct shape. And the nice thing about it, doing another cardboard, is then you just unfold it flat again and lay it out on the aluminum and cut it out of aluminum. So I'll get those um, either cut out or at least I'll get it set up. I haven't decided if I'm going to cut those out on the bandsaw. Uh, the metal cutting blade on my bandsaw is really, really dull, so I don't know that it's even in the aluminum. I don't know that it's going to, it was a hard piece of carbon on a piece of steel that I cut, and so it pretty much took the edge off all the teeth. So um, I'll probably I'll probably do it on the plasma cutter because it cuts aluminum really, really nice and you can like zip through it like butter. So I'll bring you back once I've laid it out and decided how I'm going to cut it. Okay, I've got you set up outside here. Anytime I, if the weather's good enough, um, good enough to be outside a plasma cut, I prefer to do it because it does make a lot of smoke, which is good for you. So uh, this is, uh, looks like about 16th inch. Um, diamond plate, it was just in a rim at the my steel supplier, so I just grabbed it versus ordering it, so it looks like it's about 16th. Um, so I'm just going to uh, cut out a rectangular piece that's got, you can, I think it's not too bright, there's the layout. Um, just flip flop the die, the triangles to use the material as efficiently as possible. So I'll cut out the rectangular first and then, uh, then work on cutting out the the diagonal lines. Okay, that was real time. So you can see with uh, aluminum, it's so much faster than pretty much any other method. I'll get you in here really close. The cut is just like you've sawed it. Um, the kerf is maybe a 32nd of an inch, so you realistically lose next to no material. There's 
towards the the edge there's a little tiny bit of slightest little bit of slag on the back but for the most part it makes a super clean cut all right there's all four pieces in a matter of what maybe seven eight minutes so uh, clearly a very quick way to accomplish all pretty much the same size I'll, uh, I'll lay the the portions that have to be notched out to, to break them to make the broke joints I'll lay those out separate and cut those out separate and then bring you back when I've got the pieces um, bent up and ready to go into place So I laid out all of the uh, cut marks and the brake lines on the pieces and I'm going to come over here and give it a shot on the bandsaw even though the, like I mentioned the blades dull but where it's aluminum I'm hoping that it'll do it because it'll be a whole lot uh, easier than trying to set up a straight edge one two six times per per uh, piece so anyway we'll give it a shot. Some of you are probably going to say hey that's a wood bandsaw yes it's typically used for that but you can put a bimetal blade on it. Um, and then works fine for steel and aluminum also. Well, that made pretty quick work of that. Saved quite a bit of time as far as setting up the straight edge, as I mentioned. So I'll get um, I'll get those broke up and um, and then we'll uh, I'll show you how they're how they're going to look on there and bring you back in a little bit. So that goes uh, really quick, or fairly quick, um, and compared to when I was doing the bandsaw or the plasma cutter or the torch, um, because there's no heat involved, there's no distortion whatsoever, and it leaves a nice clean edge. So on um, sheet metal that's thin enough, the electric shears are by far the method and it leaves you one of these cool little spiral thingies alrighty so I got one fender pretty much completely mocked up here I want to show you kind of how I went about doing that as you know I mounted the um, the fender brackets off of the frame so those are in a fixed position that won't won't move so I just basically clamped the fender in there and brought the fender up until I had the height that I wanted for tire to fender clearance. I made sure they were square this way so that they were nice and um, plumb. You might even be able to kind of eyeball down the tires there. They're on the same plane as the tires. Then I laid the splash shield or filler piece in there. And my original scribe was really, really close. Um, but it was off a little bit on the one end so that splash shield is just shut it sitting on it's like a 16th inch shim just so it doesn't rub and wear the paint off i came around on the inside of the fender and scribed this would be the equivalent of you can see. you can see in here i scribed that line which would be this i scribed on the inside of this which is that line you can see here and then I just add a half an inch to that and cut that off. And that brings that overlap piece up 
a half of an inch, which kind of corresponds with this Sharpie line that you can see. So I end up with a half of an inch overlap joint. So that's basically the setup and layout on how I fit those pieces. I'm just using a Rolock disc on the little angle grinder to kind of scuff up that area where I'm going to put the weld through primer. Uh, if anybody's never used a weld through primer, it's just a zinc. It's a paint product that has a lot of zinc in it. The intent behind it is that when you weld that area where it's at, it'll get hot and kind of seal, melt back and seal around the weld itself, trying to keep preventing uh, moisture from getting in there. It's better than nothing. It's not perfect but it does help uh, compared to just doing nothing. This weld through primer is pretty old, so I'm hoping that uh, it hasn't lost all of its propellant. If it is, I'll have to carefully poke a hole in it and drain it out and just put it in a spray gun and do it that way. Nope, it is completely dead. So it is possible that this paint uh, nozzle, or the, not the nozzle, because the nozzle, I tried a brand new one, that the valve near the top is just plugged up, and the can can still have pressurized pressure in it, which can get a little messy if, if, if you've ever poked a hole in a pressurized paint can. So I thought I'd film this, and you might get a laugh out of it, or it might be pretty uneventful. So I, anyway, I've got it clamped in, a portable vise there, and I'm just going to lay a rag across the top and I sharpen the center punch and I'll just give it a little tap and poke a little hole with it with the kind of through the rags and hopefully I won't end, end up all painted. There was still some pressure in there but not much. Again, if I didn't mention, I think I did, I'm just going to stitch weld this. Um, and then use seam sealer in between the stitches. So I'll kind of lay those out so they're consistent. Okay, so that's the uh, thinner squared away there. Having that zinc on there really makes it kind of nasty and spattery. I'm going to go take a break for lunch, and then I'll come back out, and we will take a look at what's next. Okay, now that those fenders are done, you see, uh, let's take a look at the punch list, kind of see what's next. So... I didn't notice that the other day when I went over this list with you, so I guess I'll go over it again. Um, so we've got the fender mounts done, the fender splash shield's done, the safety chains are on. The next item is ramp holders, handles. I'll talk about that. Final welding, the ICC lights. License plate mount. Uh, that depends on what size of plate I'm going to use. I haven't decided yet. I've got to talk to 
DOL and see if I can use a small plate on this trailer. Uh, the fender steps mostly done, torque the wheels, battery box, toolbox, spare tire mount, uh, the board hold downs, and breakaway battery to mount. So that next item on there is the ramp holders. That's gonna be, it's something that I kind of decided to do, not really last minute, but part way through the build I decided to do it. And what, what kind of the idea behind that is, would be that if I haul something that happens to be extra long, in fact, long enough that once I pulled it up the ramps, I couldn't get it far enough on the trailer to fold the ramps up, then you'd end up with a situation where you'd have to kind of jury rig the ramps, tie them to the back or whatever it is. So what I'm gonna do is, let me grab a jack. Always fold the ramps back up. But if I happen to have the ramps something tall, like I said, what I'm gonna do is, I wanna be able to fold the ramps up this far and just lock them in that position so that you can still have something on here 20 feet long. Um, so what I think I'm gonna do is, there's a couple different ways to do it. To do it, what I decided to do is I'm gonna make a link or just a bar that has two probably half inch holes in them and think think about this tape measure is as a bar so i'm going to go with about a bar that has two holes in it the bar will be about 28 inches long or so and this will only work with the ramp scooted to the outside so that's normally where they would be anyway so that bar when they're ramps in that position that bar will just go in here kind of at a diagonal like that and um, there'll be a hole in each end It'll flip over a pin that'll be right here. And then there'll also be a pin down here. And those pin, those pins will have a cross drill hole for a little hairpin. So when those bars are in place, that locks the ramp in that position. And then there happens to be, since the ramps are 30 inches wide, right in here on the tubing for the ramp, and on the other side, I'll put the same half inch pin with a little rubber washer so they don't bang. So when they're not being used, they can go in there over two pins in there with those same hair clips to keep them from falling off. And that way they'll be stored inside of the folding ramp. All righty, I got the um, pins made that those um, lock bars will attach to. Um, there are six of them, two for each side to hold the ramp and then two pins that the, will be storage pins. So um, because the ramp is channeled, there's a recess here, so that pin needs to be longer to, to get the bar out here. But the main frame down here is flat. It doesn't need to be recessed. So basically, I made two different pin lengths, three-quarter inch and uh, I think it was an inch and a half. But they're just a piece of five-eighths cold uh, rolled with a cross hole drilled in it for a hairpin or a safety pin, and then there's a machine to chamfer on the end as a weld prep to give a place for the weld bead in there faced off on the end. So like I, when I made, I think it was early on, I made a pin, I think it was for the jig to hold the cross members and talked about how if I'm gonna do a pin so you don't have to try to hold it square in both axes, um, I face them off in the lay. That way they're, if you clamp them down really, really tight, um, that holds them square in both, both, uh, Position. So, alrighty, so this morning I came out and finished up the ramp holders and handles. Those were the next items on the punch list. So, I'll kind of show you how that worked out. Um, the handles are just this here. It's uh, that kind of gold cover because it was a piece of uh, ground rod I had left over, which is steel, but just copper copper coated, um, so I repurposed that. And then I also added those 5 8 pins that I talked about. One up here on the ramp and one down on the frame. So as you can see, the ramp is in a upright position um, and it's held there 
because of that bar. So when the bar is not connected, the ramps will pull all the way either down the trailer or they'll fall all the way down the ground. And the bar just goes in place. And it holds them at that upright position if you have something too long um, on the trailer and it doesn't let the ramps fold down. And then As I mentioned, to keep from losing them, or let's say you took them off the trailer and you forgot you took them off and then you needed them out there, then you'd be in a pickle. So on the underside of the one ramp, I put two more pins. That uh, are long enough stores both ramps and you just put another keeper pin through there and that way they'll always be with the trailer and you don't have to worry about losing those. So, got quite a bit more footage than I thought by the time I edited down. Um, we're at probably close to 40 minutes. I was hoping to be able to finish all the punch list items in this episode and then the next episode will be paint prep and paint. Um, but I didn't quit quite get there but again in looking at the punch list the items frankly most of them that are on there um, that I just covered in that last footage they're items that really aren't anything special that you probably wouldn't be that interested in basically it's the um, the fender steps which I did get those broke up I've got one here I got those broke up this notches for the bracket um, take the corners together um, so anyway, those just set in the corner. I'll show you one of those. So other than bolting those in, but that'll be after paint anyway. There really wasn't much there to see. So there's one of them in place there. So other than really mounting a battery box which is nothing special let's look at the list here so battery box is nothing special the toolbox you've already seen that that's just bolting it through the bottom the spare tire mount I did decide that it's not going to be a or at least I decided enough that it's not going to be a bolt-on bracket or excuse me a weld-on bracket I still haven't decided because that way it's permanent if it's in the way it's in the way so I still haven't decided whether I'll use the winch mounts or mount it at the back but regardless it'll be bolt-on affair so I can always show you that later when I get around to that uh, let's see I got the three holes drilled for the ICC lights to go down here the uh, I got some final flat disc work. Um, I'm going to pull it outside. I'm going to do a little bit of sandblasting. I'll probably record that in the painting video just to get in some of those nooks and crannies that I can't reach with the flat disc. So really that's about it. The license plate mount, that's going to be, I think I talked about it, that's just going to be over in that ramp on the end. So there's just going to be a couple little clips that it bolts to. And then um, I found these kind of handy dandy little they're actually a mounting stud with a light built in um, so they're a quarter inch stud and nut that you could hold the license plate down with or whatever but then they've got little leds built in on a pigtail so those will actually be the license plate mounting bolts and since you have to have a license plate light that'll satisfy that need there so i think i'm going to wrap this episode up um, what few things I have left wouldn't be of much interest to you. And so come back next week. Actually, it depends on the weather. As you know, I probably, or I always release the videos early on Saturday morning. So depending on what happens weather-wise, if the weather doesn't cooperate with painting, 
There may or may not be a video on Saturday morning, though. If it is crappy weather, I might what, I might film the few little things that are left and throw out a, a 10 or 15 minute one next Saturday. But regardless, um, it's a good opportunity to click the notifications bell. So that way when I do post the painting video, which I think everybody's hopefully looking forward to, you'll get a notification for that. So um, again, I'll see you when we're ready to shoot some paint.